Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. This is Basketball History 101 with Rick Loiza. Welcome back to Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network. I am your host, Rick Loiza, and this is the podcast where we bring to life some of the forgotten stories from basketball history. And today, we bring you a story about a pioneer who broke several color barriers. His name was Don Barksdale. He was the first African-American player to be named an All-American in college. He was the first African-American to play on Team USA at the Olympics. And he was also the first African-American player to make an NBA All-Star game in 1953. Now, he was not the first black player to play in the NBA. That honor belongs to Chuck Cooper. But Barksdale was the first one to reach the All-Star game. Barksdale has an unusual road to the NBA. But let us go back to the beginning of his story. He was born on March 31, 1923 in Oakland, California. His father, R.G., was a Pullman porter. Now, back before America switched to traveling long distances by airplane, most Americans traveled by train. Pullman was the name in train passenger cars. The Pullman Company was the manufacturer of sleeping and passenger cars that were used to help people crisscross the country by rail. They made sleeper cars, lounge cars, dining cars, and just about any other type of car meant for passengers. In their day, the Pullman cars were the height of luxury. In essence, Pullman was like a traveling hotel. You would check in at the station of departure. They would show you to your sleeping compartment. They would also show you where the lounge and the dining cars were. And the porters were exclusively black men. They became known as Pullman porters. And they did everything from help you with your bags, take your food or drink orders, knock on your door if you needed a wake-up call, and even bring you that day's newspaper from whichever city you were traveling through. This is what Don Barksdale's father did for a living. He was regularly away for work on the train. This is how young Don was raised, by two very hardworking parents. Very little is known about his mother Desiree, other than that she was a stay-at-home mother and was there with him while his father was away working. They did not have a lot of money, but they did have enough that they were able to buy young Don a basketball for him to play with at the park. When he was just 14 years old, he went to see a college football game. The local university was California, or Cal for short, and they were playing host to UCLA, which featured Jackie Robinson at running back. Barksdale gained a hero that day in Jackie Robinson. Young Don was mesmerized by Robinson's ability to dominate a game featuring mostly white players. Little did he or anyone else know that Robinson would go on to break the color barrier in baseball when he suited up for the Brooklyn Dodgers in 1947. Young Don showed a great skill in multiple sports. He attended Berkeley High School in Berkeley, California, where he tried out for the basketball team. Unfortunately, because of racism on the part of the head coach, Barksdale was cut every single year even though he was an eligible player and probably better than anyone else that they had. So he had no choice but to develop his game at the city parks in Berkeley playing pickup basketball unable to play for his own school. The silver lining if there even is one is that the games at the park often featured good college players which forced Barkdale to improve his game in order to keep up with everyone on the court and improve he did. Barksdale graduated from high school in 1941 and then he went on to Marin Community College on the north end of the Bay Area where he grew up. Even though he had never played organized basketball before, he led the team in scoring and was their star player. With Barksdale on the team 
they won the equivalent of the state championship of California for community colleges. He graduated from Marin College in 1943, and then from there, he entered the Army and served two years stationed in Virginia. However, while in Virginia, serving and playing basketball with the Army, he caught the attention of the Harlem Globetrotters. They were very interested in him and offered him a spot on the team when they were traveling on the East Coast. Barksdale himself said that he nearly accepted the offer. He said that he suited up and was on his way to the arena while on leave when he suddenly changed his mind and backed out. He was afraid of losing his amateur status because he still wanted to complete college and play more college basketball. If he had played even one game for the Globetrotters, his amateur status would have disappeared and he would have been ineligible to play any more college basketball and he still had two more years of eligibility. Barksdale completed his two years of service with the Army. The end of his service was triggered by the end of World War II. The Army was letting a bunch of soldiers go as they were no longer needed. So he was now free to resume his college studies. And he had a scholarship offer from UCLA, the same school that his hero Jackie Robinson attended. Barksdale would compete on the basketball team and the track team. He excelled at UCLA. Unfortunately, records were not kept very well during the 1940s, but we do know that UCLA did very well while Barksdale was there going 18-7 and and winning the conference for the 1946-1947 season. And the reason that we know he did well is because he was named an All-American at the end of the season in 1947, becoming the first black player to earn such an honor. He was also the NCAA national champion in the triple jump for the track team. However, in another twist, the NBA was not yet ready to start taking in black players. That would not happen for three more years. So there he was, one of the best college players in the country, and no professional league would take him because of the color of his skin. So he turned to the only place where he could continue playing and continue to develop his skills, the AAU. AAU, which stands for the Amateur Athletic Union, was a national circuit of amateur teams. Today, the AAU teams pretty much only go up to high school. But back then, you had amateur teams made up of grown men who still maintained their amateur status. Some of the better teams could secure sponsorship to pay for uniforms and travel expenses. Typically, the team would name themselves after the sponsor in order to give that sponsor advertising. In some cases, the players were employees of the sponsoring company, so they were paid as regular employees and not as basketball players, which helped them maintain their amateur status. Basically, they were professionals in disguise. One of these teams was the Oakland Bittners, named after the Bittner Company, which sold insurance and provided tax services. Lou Bittner, the owner of the company, had no problem having black players on his team. He just wanted to win. So he went after the best players, regardless of skin color. And Barksdale played for the Oakland Bittners while at UCLA and led them to second place in the national tournament in 1947, right after finishing his time at UCLA. They lost the championship game to the Phillips 66ers of Oklahoma by a score of 62 to 41. But the main result of the season with the Bittners is that it led to a chance with the US Olympic team where he proved his worth and became the first black player to make an American Olympic basketball team. And how players made the Olympic basketball team back then was a bit unusual compared to today. I talked about this back in episode 37 on Adolf Rupp, but I'll go over it again here. The Olympic Committee created a tournament that took place in Madison Square Garden in New York. They invited the eight best amateur teams in the country to participate. In the college half of the bracket, they invited the NCAA champion, the University of Kentucky. They also invited Baylor University, the University of Louisville, and New York University for their overall success that season. The other half of the bracket was for non-college amateur teams. That included the YMCA national champion, a team called the Brooklyn Prospect Park YMCA. They also invited the top three teams from the most recent AAU national championship tournament which included the champions, the Phillips 66ers, the Denver Nuggets, no connection at all to the modern Denver Nuggets, and the Oakland Bittners. This bracket setup ensured that a college team would play a non-college team for the championship, 
where the Phillips 66ers defeated the University of Kentucky. But this is how they actually selected the players that would represent the United States in the Olympics. The five starters from the 66ers and the five starters from the University of Kentucky would automatically get the first 10 spots on the Olympic team since their teams finished first and second in this Olympic tournament. The Olympic Committee then offered the remaining four spots to the four best players from the rest of the six teams at the tournament. And Barksdale had proven himself to be one of those four players. Now in order to raise money to help pay for their expenses to London for the Olympics, the basketball team traveled around the Midwest and the South of the United States playing exhibition games to raise money for their trip. They divided the Olympic team into two squads and they played each other for this tour. The five players from the 66ers were on one team and the five Wildcats from the University of Kentucky were on the other team. And then the four extra players were divided two and two to fill out each squad. Barksdale ended up on the 66ers team for this exhibition tour. For the most part, the games went quite well and they sold a lot of tickets, raising a lot of money, of course. But in yet another tragic twist, the color of Barksdale's skin became an issue when the team went to Lexington, Kentucky to play a game. Since five of the players were from the University of Kentucky, as well as the Olympic assistant coach Adolph Rupp, it made sense to play an exhibition game in front of the home crowd. But Rupp suggested that Barksdale not play in the game since Kentucky was still a segregated state. There was no specific law that would have prevented Barksdale from playing. Rupp just thought that it would turn off the fans since no black athlete had ever competed in any sport on the campus of the University of Kentucky. Now this is where I give his teammates a lot of credit. The rest of the team stood up to the coaches and insisted that Barksdale play the game. The coaches finally gave in and Barksdale played. And to everyone's surprise, none of the fans in attendance did anything. Now, maybe that some of them wanted to do something, but they didn't. He did get a death threat the night before the game, but nothing happened at the game itself. In fact, he got a big ovation when he was introduced before the game and again after the game. And this was a big surprise. This was the first time that an integrated team played in Lexington, Kentucky. But there was one tense moment during the game. During a first half timeout, the trainer came out with a bottle of water for the players to share. Now, they didn't have that six pack of Gatorade bottles like they do today. Back then, if you were an integrated team with black and white players, the trainer would bring out two bottles of water during a timeout. One bottle was for the white players, and the second bottle was for the black players. In this case, the trainer only brought out one bottle. The entire place went dead silent as everybody wanted to see what would happen with that bottle. Three white players took turns drinking from the bottle before it was passed to Barksdale. Normally in this situation, a black player would have refused to drink from the bottle so as not to offend the white fans. But Barksdale did not care. He took a drink just like all the other guys did. But now was the real moment of truth. Barksdale passed the bottle to the next guy, Gordon Carpenter. What would Carpenter do? A black player had just taken a drink from the bottle. Well, Carpenter took the bottle without hesitation and drank from it just like everybody else did. The tension in the entire place just melted away. Barksdale turned to Carpenter and thanked him for the gesture. And Carpenter said, quote, Never a doubt, Barks. Unquote. It's crazy how little things like this could become a big deal, but not on this day. Just as a side note, when they took the tour to Oklahoma to play in front of the Phillips 66ers fans, that became the first time an integrated team played a game in any sport in the state of Oklahoma. It seems like that everywhere he went, Barksdale was breaking a color barrier. Anyway, it was a very successful tour, and they raised a lot of money for the team, and they had all of their expenses covered to go to London. So off they went. And during pool play, they easily defeated Switzerland, Czechoslovakia, Argentina, Egypt, and Peru. They then moved on to the elimination round with a perfect record. They defeated Uruguay in the quarterfinals by a score of 63 to 28. Then they defeated Mexico in the semifinals 71 to 40. And then they moved on to the final game where they won the gold medal by beating France 65 to 21. That is how he became the first black player from any country to win an Olympic gold medal in basketball. He was the third leading scorer on the team, 
but easily the best overall player, as he also was a dominant player on the rebounds and great on defense. And as just one more side note, he had an opportunity to go to the Olympics that summer with the track team as well for the triple jump. As I mentioned, he was the NCAA champion in the triple jump and stood a strong chance of making the Olympic track team in that event. But he decided to try to make the basketball team instead. That was an interesting decision because the track team had been integrated for years and his participation would not have drawn any undue attention. So after coming off the gold medal summer, Barksdale returns to his AAU team. And this is actually a good place to stop and take a break. And I'll be right back with the rest of Barksdale's story right after this. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Welcome back to the show, and let's keep going with Barksdale's story. As I said, he had just returned to the United States from playing in the Olympics in London that summer in 1948. And since he could not go to the NBA, he ended up returning to his AAU team, the Bittners. And they would go on to win the AAU National Championship in 1949. They defeated the Phillips 66ers in the championship game by a score of 55-51. to And this was a big deal because the 66ers had won the previous six national championships in a row. It probably didn't hurt that Barksdale played alongside the five starters from the 66ers in the Olympics that previous summer. He knew their tendencies and probably gave his Bittner teammates a very detailed scouting report. Back then, winning the AAU National Championship was a significant accomplishment. For many basketball fans, winning the AAU was actually bigger than winning the NCAA Championship. The AAU featured teams of grown men who often outplayed college teams on the occasion when an AAU team and a college team played each other. The AAU was no joke, as the top teams featured some of the best players in the country. Many of the great players at the time actually chose to play on an AAU team instead of playing in the NBA, which was only three years old at this point. A player with a college degree could often make more money working in a corporate job and then playing for an AAU team on the weekends than he could make in the NBA. Now think about that for a moment. It would be another five or six years before the NBA salaries reached a point where the best players consistently chose the NBA over the AAU. But once that point was reached, adult AAU was significantly diminished. The last time they put on a national tournament was in 2005, and the last one before that was 1999. So as you can see, the AAU for adults isn't really a thing anymore. But anyway, back to Barksdale and the AAU championship. He impressed at the tournament and was finally on the NBA radar. Things were starting to change and it would not be long until black players were signed to play on NBA teams. In the meantime, he continued playing for the Oakland Bittners, who had changed their name to the Oakland Blue and Gold Atlas since Bittner was no longer their sponsor. Barksdale continued to improve and develop. However, he also needed to pay the bills until he got paid for his basketball. So he opened up a record store and ran that business to great success. Through that experience, he got to be friends with some of the best jazz musicians of the day who would make sure to stop by his shop when traveling through to perform. He also had a radio show where he would feature some of the best black music artists of the day. He had a smooth voice that was perfect for radio. In the black community, he quickly became the most popular DJ on the radio and became a local celebrity. At 6'6", you could not miss him when he walked into a room. He also worked as a beer distributor, and between that job and the record shop, he was making a really good living for a black man in the 1940s. But as 1950 rolled around, the NBA had changed their minds and began to allow black players to join the league. And there was definitely a spot for Barksdale. Everybody knew how good he was. He signed with the Baltimore Bullets as their highest paid player. But it was still a pay cut compared to what he was making selling beer and jazz records back in Berkeley, California. After four years of college, two years in the Army, and three more years playing AAU basketball, by the time that Barksdale signed with Baltimore, he was a 28-year-old rookie. Just for some perspective, by the time that Kobe Bryant and LeBron James were 28 years old, they were both in their 11th season in the NBA. 
Due to relatively primitive training techniques and medical care, back in the early 1950s, most players were retiring between the ages of 30 and 32 because their bodies had all but broken down by that age. Today, players regularly make it into their late 30s and even into their early 40s before retiring from basketball. So given that he was 28 by the time he started in the NBA, he was not bound to have a very long career. But in his second season with Baltimore, averaging just over 13 points per game and 9 rebounds, he was selected to the NBA All-Star Game, thereby becoming the first black player to be an NBA All-Star. He played 11 minutes in that game and scored just a single point on a free throw. But his impact in the bigger scheme of things was enormous. After two seasons with Baltimore, he was traded to Boston where he would play with Bob Cousy for two years under coach Red Arbach. At the time, Bill Russell was still in college, so these were not the dominant Celtics that were winning championships year after year. But Arbach did have some very nice things to say about Barksdale. He said, quote, Watching Don play basketball was like watching a ballet. He was past his prime when we got him, but you could still see the quality there, unquote. He only ever went to that one All-Star game, and he finished his four-year NBA career with an average of 11 points and 8 rebounds per game. At the age of 31, he was completely done with basketball as he suffered a series of ankle injuries. He then returned to the Bay Area where he expanded his record shop into a music label and a recording studio. He also opened two nightclubs in Oakland, as well as returning to being a DJ. And that's how he led his life for the rest of his days as a business owner and an entrepreneur. He maintained his local celebrity and became friends with black celebrities of all types like athletes, comedians, singers, musicians, actors, and more. He became so well known as a club owner, music producer, and DJ that most people never realized that he had an Olympic gold medal and played in the NBA. He was definitely a renaissance man with a variety of skills in many different areas. He achieved great success at almost everything he tried. So after a long career in music and club ownership, he succumbed to his battle with throat cancer on March 8, 1993, at the age of 69. He was posthumously enshrined into the Basketball Hall of Fame as a contributor for breaking several color barriers during his playing career. So if you ever hear any of the following three questions, who was the first black college player to make All-American? Who was the first black basketball player to play for Team USA at the Olympics? And who was the first black player to be an NBA All-Star? The answer to all three questions is Don Barksdale. He paved the way for so many others that came behind him. Every NBA player should know his name. Actually, all of us who consider ourselves fans of basketball should remember his name. He was a true pioneer. Well, that wraps it up for today. Join us next week as we talk about a college player by the name of Bevo Francis. He not only had a 100 point game in college, he had two of them. That's next time on Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network, the headquarters of Sports Yesteryear. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com to find out more about this and other sports history podcasts. If you like what you hear, please hit that subscribe button wherever you get your podcasts. Also, go ahead and give us a rating and a review, and that will help others to find this podcast more easily. And check out our page on Facebook. It's called Basketball History 101 Podcast. There you will find shorter historical posts as well as comments and discussion starters on today's game. I'll also announce there when new episodes come out. I want to thank my producer and editor, Jacob Loiza. Join us each week as we continue to mine the history of basketball for more great stories from the past. Take care, and see you soon. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday's Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories, and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com 
slash sports history books. Pick up your copy today. Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.